seems like everyone took notice of not only this evening, but the importance of this, whether you're single or married, have young children, or hope to have children, or have grandchildren, or grown children. This is an important topic for all of us as a local church to think about, one, uh, how we might steward the gospel, not only from preaching in the pulpit and in our evangelistic conversations, but in our homes and in the lives of people that we invest in, the families that the Lord entrusts to us at a variety of different levels. I'm really thankful when I'm thinking of this, this line in particular in the description that we put for Sunday Night Theology. The tyranny of the urgent triumphs over the much-needed virtue of investing relationally in one another. That's not only true for the way to think about family, but certainly true for the way to think about uh, a significant portion of our lives. The tyranny of the urgent drowns out the gospel and the way that we might apply it to a variety of areas in our lives. So I'm really glad that you're here. Uh, this evening, I'm very thankful uh, for Julie making time to be with us. Julie is a faculty member at CCF. She holds an MA in counseling from the Biblical Theological Seminary. She's a licensed professional counselor with over 15 years of counseling experience. She has extensive experience with women's issues, sexual abuse, body image issues, parenting and child maltreatment issues, and regularly speaks at events on these topics. Julie is also a registered, uh, registered play therapist and has developed a play therapy office at CCF to better serve families, teens, and children. She is a trained facilitator for Stewards of Children, a nonprofit organization that provides training on child sexual abuse. Julie has trained on therapy, uh, a therapy uh, dog that she works with both professionally and on a volunteer basis. Julie and her husband Greg have six children and serve as foster and adoptive parents. Julie, we're really thankful to have you with us uh, this evening. I hope that you all will uh, pay attention as she, uh, as she lectures to us and then be prepared to ask some questions. I'm going to pray for our time together and ask the Lord might help us. Let's pray. Amen. Father, we are so thankful for your work of grace in our lives that you have been kind to not only save us, uh, but to place us in the context of the local church and to give us your friends as our own. Uh, we thank you for days like Sunday where we can carve out time to worship corporately uh, in the morning and for evenings like this in particular where we can come together to study, uh, to try to understand your word, to understand con concepts related to your word, uh, to think about tonight in particular a nurturing family. Lord, I know that in this room there are a variety of people who have uh, a huge swath of different experiences in their homes. Some have come from very strong homes. Uh, with uh, wonderful experiences, and some have come from very difficult homes with not so wonderful experiences. Some have experienced uh, tragedy in their own life, or they know others who have experienced tragedy such as abuse. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us this evening, that we might focus our attention uh, on the lecture and on your word in particular, that we might think about your Christ even now, that you might help us to apply this to our own lives so that we might bring the gospel to bear on the lives of people around us. I think of Mike and Diane outside of the uh, building here just across the alleyway. I think of Dominic and Deirdre across the street with their children, Stella and Madison, and a host of other people in our community who desperately need truths like this applied to their lives. We pray that you put them in our path, uh, Lord, that we might be able to share the truth with them, that we might be able to build meaningful friendships with us, them, and Lord, that you might use our homes as uh, a means of proclaiming your gospel, the way that we organize and structure our families and think about how the gospel uh, brings light on how we steward the opportunities you entrust to us as a family. Um, pray for Julie, help her now, give her clarity, even as she speaks. And we ask all of this in the name of our God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. There's a seat down here. Can you one? And then there's one right there beside you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you and so much. And then there's two of them. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I said you tried to ask how we're doing the slides. Are you going to be uh, really warm enough? Can you go ahead and do that? Um, so, a couple of things. One is, I hate being a talking head. So the more you guys want to ask questions, the better. Um, and so we can leave Q&A at the end, but actually I'd encourage you guys, feel free to raise your hand, say, hey, can I ask you a question about that? I would love for it to be more conversational. Um, one of the things I want you to think about is how do you define a, a Christian home? What does that look like to you? You don't have to answer, just think for a minute. When you think of a good, good Christian home, uh, what are your expectations? Or another way I say it is, what are you, what's your ideal that you have in your mind? Just take a minute and think about it. Maybe it's uh, you immediately envision a family that you know. 
Maybe it's your family that you came from. Many, maybe it's the opposite of the family you came from, right? What is it? Now we can move on to the next slide. So my question is, uh, it just flipped up. So what do you do when God appears to give you less than the ideal? And there's one of the things I see over and over again that we tend to live by ideals, um, but our ideals are not normally what God gives us. So can you go back, go to the next slide for a minute? So another way of saying that is, here's where I will make you guys call out for a minute. I want you to think, what are some examples of uh, family, some good examples of a Christian family in scripture? Now we're not talking about two people in a relationship. We're talking about a family. What family can you look at and say, this was a model family in scripture, of a biblical family? Anybody? Yeah. Joseph and Mary and Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what about the rest of the siblings? Were they angels or demons? Yeah. <laughs> All right, put up the next one. So now I want you to call out what are bad examples of families in scripture. Seriously. David. Lot and his daughters. Lot and his daughters. I don't think anybody wants to model their home after that. Right? Jacob. Jacob's family. Jacob. Noah. Eli. David. Abraham and Sarah. So all you have to do is start in Genesis and just keep going until you get to Revelation, right? There's example after example of bad parenting, bad sibling rivalry, bad ways of passing on your lineage, all kinds of bad stuff in scripture. When you think of it that way, actually my kids look pretty good, right? <laughs> your family of origin probably looks pretty good when you start thinking of what are all the things, and these were the people God used, right? So what does that tell you, going back to our ideal that we tend to put out there? That unfortunately, for whatever reason, in the church, especially in Christian communities, we buy into there is an ideal that we have. Yet, I would argue scripture doesn't give you that ideal at all. It gives you principles, but it doesn't give you an ideal that you and I need to be modeling after. You guys can push back here, but I'll keep talking out what I mean by that. So much like nurturing any relationship, family life is very similar. That what does it look like to build one another up, to be iron sharpening iron, to disciple, all the things that we need to think of. One of my favorite passages I've been thinking and talking a lot about is um, it's in uh, Ephesians 5 2 it says be imitators of God uh, be imitators of God it's dearly loved children and think about that a minute when we think of being imitators <coughs> excuse me allergy season's kicking in when we think of being imitators of of God um, I think there's a shift in what it means to be a conduit of God's character and what it means to go about and try to actually imitate his character. So let me give you a personal example. I like to share this a lot when I do, do talks, uh, just because it's such a good example. But years ago, I'll share my family story a little bit to, to demonstrate how we've had to live this out. But when I was still single, I became the foster parent of our two daughters. Um, and so they were about two and three at the time. And if you talk to anybody who knew me the first three months I had them, they said I went from being this kind of prissy, single person to this haggard-looking person as I was adjusting <laughs> to having a two- and three-year-old toddler. So one day I came home from CCEF, and I was picking them up from their preschools and where they're at, and they were just running circles around me, and I'm trying to figure out, what do I make them for dinner? What do I make me for dinner? And I sat down on the floor with them, and they just naturally began playing with my hair. So I was happy because they were occupied. We all know this feeling. They were occupied. They weren't asking for anything. So I sat there for a few minutes. So they did what little girls do, and they go running into the bathroom, and they got their big box of barrettes and shiny clips and brushes and everything they had. And so at the time, my hair was probably twice as long. I was looking like Medusa with all these snake-like <laughs> appendages coming out and clips. And I mean, I probably should have taken a picture. About 10, 15 minutes in, one of my daughters did something that she saw me do every morning, and that would be when um, they would get up from uh, when they would get up from sleeping, and I'm getting them ready in the morning. I would take the brush and I'd run it under the water, and then I'd brush their hair to smooth it out, get out away all the flyaway. So, 
Brittany, my oldest at the time, thought it was a great idea, while these snake-like appendages are in my head, to go do that. She put the brush under the water, got it sopping wet, was carrying it in the room like this, and then trying to brush my hair um, as she did that. So her little sister followed suit. They were back and forth, back and forth, until probably the third or fourth time in, a thought struck me. And that thought was, Kimmy, who was the youngest, was really too small to reach the sink. <laughs> Think about this a minute. <laughs> Let it sink in. So as I'm sitting there, the thought dawned on me that, where, what, where is she getting the water from? So I get on my hands and knees, and I crawl over, and I look in the bathroom, and sure enough, there she is dipping it in the toilet. <laughs> right? So... Uh, yeah, I wish I could say that was one of my finer parenting moments. It probably <laughs> wasn't. Um, and later on that night, I found that there was also cucumber melon antibacterial soap in my hair. I don't know how that got there, but I could hope the two canceled each other out by the end of the <laughs> night. So here is Kimmy, who thought she was imitating my behavior, right? I would say that was grossly off. And I do mean grossly, right? She was being an imitator of her mom in that moment, but not the way I would have wanted her to imitate it. And I think of this imagery um, of a waterfall, this waterfall effect that you see over and over again in Scripture that we're called to be imitators of Christ, to love as I have loved you, to forgive as you have been forgiven, um, to show grace as grace has been given to you, to comfort with the comfort you've been given. So you have this, this waterfall effect. But unfortunately, we're over here trying to dig our own waterfall and imitate God rather than say we're called to be a conduit. We're called to let his life live and breathe through us. So much like Kimmy's imitation of me, it mattered where the source of water came from, did it not? It did feel differently than how I did their hair. That's often how I think, and the Lord uses that example over and over again in my own life to say, I wonder when my kids see me engaging with them, or my husband sees me engaging with them, or maybe even the people I counsel, or my friends, or my coworkers. how often does my imitation of Christ look grossly off um, from what it's really called to be? And so before you can even talk about nurturing family and nurturing relationships at large, there is what does it really look like to be an imitator of Christ? How do I say I really need to empty myself of me and ask the Lord to be at work through me and in me? Because if we don't start there, everything else I'm going to say is going to be a bunch of baloney. It just will. Because we're going to be doing it all in our own strength. And when we do things in our own moral fortitude, we often fail. <coughs> and we might maintain it for a period of time, but we can't maintain it. And we will fail our kids. We will fail our spouses. We will fail each other when we do it that way. Can you go to the next slide? So why do we struggle in family life? Um, you can keep clicking on it. So many reasons, right? The pace of life. It's just hard work. Most people are working. Uh, most two-parent homes are working. Then you have a single-parent home where it is one person being the mother, the father, the breadwinner, and trying to keep up with scheduling. You have cultural priorities. I would say as a counselor, one of my greatest fears is some of the cultural beliefs we are buying into for our families today. Mm -hmm. Things like all of our kids should have cell phones or technology. Um, things like it makes perfect sense that my kids are with their peers all the time and we have peers raising peers now. Um, there are cultural priorities I think we buy into without thinking because everybody around us is doing them. And it appears that they're doing it successfully, so why shouldn't we be allowing our young people, or why as a family shouldn't we be doing it as well? Feeling inadequate. We struggle with this because sometimes we just feel we're bad at being a parent, or we're bad at accomplishing what we need to do, or we're always failing at something. I think another issue, particularly in parenting, is I can value compliance over relationship, yeah. over dialogue, right? That I just want my kids to listen. I want to argue. I don't want to debate it out with them. Just do what I tell you to do and make life easier for me, right? Um, we look for quick fixes rather than long-term bridge building. So nurturing family is this, what does it mean long-term? What do I know about the people in front of me and their needs and how God's calling me to be wise and love them well? Um, and it all comes down to we serve the wrong agenda. You can go to the next slides. What do I mean by we serve the wrong agenda? Excuse me. Yeah. There's a big spider and he's going to... Oh. 
please do. <laughs> well, I can sit down now. I can't outdo that one. This is way we, and you would have seen me freak out while I crawl up my leg as you all watch. All right. So, freedom from formula. What does this mean? What's the wrong agenda? I think the agenda is that we buy into a formula. There's the short version. What is the formula you and I, the ideal, the formula, whatever language you want to use, what is the formula that you want? And there are great parenting books. As a matter of fact, it's my, um, my editor who helped me write the book, Child Proof. She was wonderful because I, every moment of it, was talking her out of why I shouldn't write the book. Why? Because I kept saying, there are so many parenting books out there. I do not want to write another parenting book. The world does not need another parenting book. We need to burn some of the parenting books, as a matter of fact. Um, and the only way she could convince me is if I said, if I could have this message. Because I believe that the formulas we try to come up with are the very things that destroy our homes and prevent us from loving our actual family well. Mm -hmm. So we're busy looking for the ideal rather than learning to love our actual family God gave us. Um, so how does scripture and conventional parenting ideals compare to your home and circumstances? What are the ways where unwittingly you are evaluating your home, your marriage, your relationships by the ones you see around you, the ones you see on social media and Facebook, uh, the ones you read about and think, well, this worked for this family or this should work in theory, so why isn't it working for me? You can go to the next one. How does the word of God apply to the uniqueness of your marriage and family? You can go to the next one. Great freedom and great responsibility come with giving up an ideal and choosing to know your family well. So <coughs> scriptural principles are timeless. They do not change. Our application of them, our contextualization of those principles does change, right? So one of the examples um, I gave in the book is the idea of foot, foot washing in scripture, that there were multiple reasons for foot washing to happen and this humility and act of service. But what we started to see in some of the New Testament churches is that that shifted and it became no longer needed in some of the churches. Why? Not because they didn't need humility and service, right? Um, but that morphed into something different. And so to understand that in scripture, the principles of relationship, the principles of living well before the face of God and the people around you don't change but you do need to contextualize it to your home and your family. And with that comes great freedom, but it comes a lot more responsibility too, right? Because we want the formula. We buy into the formula. And the formula makes it easy. If I just do A, B, and C, then here I have the perfect family, the perfect child, the perfect marriage. Um, our goal is not success, at least as the world defines it, but really faithfulness to the task. Mm -hmm. So again, think about that for a minute. When I focus on compliance rather than relationship, um, when I mean relationship, relationship with my child, but also my child's relationship with the Lord, I miss, I miss that if I'm all about compliance. Um, and we look at success. Again, here's a cultural value that we tend to buy into, right? That success is what? That our kids go to a great college, that they just graduate high school, um, that they are successful in ministry, that they marry, that they don't marry, what, what is the ideal that we're going for and how do you measure success? Rather than saying if you and I would just commit to faithfulness to what God calls us to do and then let go of what our children's behavior and choices are, then we're trusting God to begin to work in their lives. But that's hard because half the time I don't like the choices my kids are making, right? But letting go of that and knowing, well, what's my job in responding to those choices? What's my job in teaching them and educating them and shepherding them? So does your picture of an ideal family keep you from understanding and loving your actual family? Let me stop for a minute. Any thoughts or questions so far? Am I putting you all to sleep already? <laughs> we go to the next one. So what do I mean by that? What's biblical wisdom? So applying biblical principles to our families means that we need the wisdom that comes from God. And here's where scripture is just rich in telling us how relationships should look, right? You can keep going. Um, that we are pursuing God faithfully, we're asking him for wisdom, and we're relying on the work of the Spirit in our lives. I can't tell you how many times as a parent 
and I'd like to credit this to Holy Spirit, I, I'm sure it is, but there's just things I knew were not going right with my kids. And I can't tell you how I knew, I just knew. Um, we always tell these funny jokes because, you know, you can spend years and years with your spouse or years and years with your kids, and you just know their looks. You know when they've got the caught look, when they've got the lying look, when they've got the mischievous look, when they've got the something's really <coughs> wrong with them, their off look. Um, so there's some of that there, where just the, the experience of knowing somebody well. But then I think the Lord, as you're praying for your kids and you're trying to think thoughtfully in your parenting or your marriage, that the Lord just gives you insight to what they need and to how to speak well or to what's missing and lacking in a moment. Um, when you and I are saying, Lord, help us to be imitators of Christ, when I'm focused more on that, then I'm going to be more intuitively aware. I'm going to be wiser with what their needs are. I'm going to be more <coughs> prayerful and committed to wanting the spirit to work in their lives and, and thinking even creatively about the way I can do that in their lives. We challenge our perceived ideas of an ideal family or my ideal. Can we go to the next one? They're always at work. So biblical principles are always at work and are timeless. It's the application we often struggle with. So again, how do you and I take the principles of scripture and how do we apply them to the uniqueness of our relationships? We see this in marriage all the time too, right? We get really caught up in roles and who should be doing things um, instead of saying, well, this is the spouse God gave me. What are you good at? What am I good at? How do we complement each other? How do we sharpen each other? How do we work hard to be a team and a partnership? How do we love well? Um, it's really fun for me. There are times that my husband will come with me to speaking events like this and I'll make him come up and do the Q&A too because we're very different personalities. Um, and that could either work to attack each other or that could work to complement each other, right? Um, and even in our parenting, what we think, we're pretty on the same line, but we come at things differently. And it's funny because days that the kids are driving me crazy, he's calm and he's cool and collected and he's handling them well. And then the days that they're driving him crazy, I'm calm and I'm collected. So imagine any of you, if you're a single parent, you don't have that ability to pass it on to somebody else when you're having a rough moment. Um, what, does, what does the Lord say about that? What does scripture have to say about a, a single parent or a grandparent who's raising a grandchild and they're left to their, to their own ability to do something and they don't have a, a spouse helping them? Um, but what we see is the Lord, so you have two different people who are married and then you have multiple personalities depending on how many children you have. Mm -hmm. So here is a house full of multiple personalities, all of them sinful, all of them with their own agendas, and they're all supposed to live happily together, right? Well, let's go back to Genesis. Do we see that in Genesis? Anybody? Want to pick a book in the Bible where we see that happening? Where we do see successful relationships are where people are just committed to loving well, where they're committed to saying, the Lord really is our God. We will serve him, and we are going to commit to loving each other. There's this subtle expectation of return that enters into relationship, right? Where um, I'll do this for you if you do it for me, and when you stop doing it for me, well then, I don't know, I'm going to withhold from you. We often begin to give to get. And I think it's really subtle, even in marriages and family life, when our kids drive us crazy, when our spouses drive us crazy, when our friends drive us crazy, when our roommates drive us crazy, right? Um, that's, there's a subtle give to get that I love with an expectation that you are going to do that back to me and dying to that, that really our lives become a living offering uh, around us. All right, next slide. <coughs> <laughs> you can just keep clicking on it and I'll talk through it. So <coughs> where does this come from? Well, our model, what our ideal really is, is the Lord, right? We see how Jesus loved well in Scripture. We see how God's love is always personal and intimate. I am so glad that God does not treat me the way he treats you. And I'm so glad that he treats you the way he treats you and me the way he treats me and my kids the way he treats me because he knows better than anybody our hearts and our needs, right? He can see, he uh, knows the depths of us. He knows where we struggle with faith and we need to be encouraged. He knows where we struggle with sin and we need to be rebuked. He knows where we struggle with heartache and he comforts us. This is the model that we're given. So what does it look like to allow our, our lives to be modeled after him? 
Uh, what's it look like to be very intentional about being personal with people? So even as a counselor, I've been doing this probably for well over 20 years now, I don't, I don't go into any counseling situation with anybody and presume I'm, I've got them all figured out. Why? Because everybody's unique. And the wisdom says you take the time to know people. I might get the struggle. I might have dealt with it hundreds of times, but I don't know you. You are a very different, unique person. And love moves towards knowing somebody well, becoming an expert at knowing the person in front of you. So our desire to mo model Christ to our kids um, must be greater than our desire for behavioral change. Now that is probably one of the biggest things for parents to struggle with, right? I want my kids, I want my kids to get good grades. I want them to be friendly and polite and mannerly and courteous, but I can't want that more than I want to be faithful to my job. And that is pretty subtle agenda change too. That way too often I'm more focused on what they need to do to be the right person than what I need to do to be the right parent before them. Go ahead, you can go to the next one. <coughs> I love quotes, so you'll see several in here. Uh, this is Howard Hendricks. He says, developing Christian standards is like building a fire in the rain. It requires willful determination against all odds to do what seems impossible. It calls for expertise, know-how, which understands the stubborn nature of a child and the nature of a hostile world. It demands a stubborn perseverance to keep fanning the flickering flame to keep protecting the hot coals. Does that make it sound like it's an easy task? No, it is not. So again, I could broaden this and say that's true about any relationship we're in, right? Mm -hmm. Relationships mm -hmm. are tough. You go to the next one. Here's another way, yeah, that's a, so let me introduce you to my family for a minute. Actually, let me take a break. So, here are the loves of my lives. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. My husband knows I say that. Um, my husband, Greg. These are our six kids. They, um, they're all adopted through the foster care system, except for Justin. Justin came to us at 16. Uh, he's 18 now. Was actually a delight to have. Here's an example of never say never. So there's few times in my life I've said never. Um, and one was, once we had younger children, one was, all right, I probably will never bring an older teenager into our home for safety reasons, for lots of reasons. And again, here we are with a teenager in our home, um, older teenager. Uh, but the short version is, so let me try to break this down. So Greg, our, our six kids, um, this is Kimmy and Brittany, who when I was single, I took them on as a foster parent. Uh, Greg and I, about a year later, got <coughs> engaged and got married, and so the girls were able to be flower girls in our wedding. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We were able to be flower girls, and probably a week before the wedding, we, we, took, we took them thinking that they would probably have to go back to their birth mother. Um, and that was really hard because it was a less than ideal situation. Um, but a week before our wedding, we had a social worker call us and say, Julie, I have a wedding present for you. You're going to be able to adopt the girls. Um, so it was really, it was just a really neat way of the Lord bringing us together as a family. And we were able to talk about, I'm going to get a new name. You guys are going to get a new name. We're going to be a family together. And Brittany, who was only five, four or five at the time, goes, um, yeah, and God knew you needed kids. <laughs> I guess God knew we needed kids. Um, so, so first year of marriage, first day of marriage, we have two kids. Um, within six months, we get a call about Andrew and William, who at the time were three and four, um, and asked what we consider taking two biological brothers. So within the first year of marriage, my poor husband, in his mid-30s, became a husband, a homeowner, a father of four, um, with a menagerie of pets that we brought into the marriage. So if you want to add as much stress as possible to your first year of marriage, do what we did. Um, if you don't, don't follow anything we did. Um, one of my favorite stories about just how we went into marriage not knowing how to do any of this, because nothing we did was in the ideal. We came into marriage with two little girls. We get two more before the end of it. We both are working. We're combining apartments. We, had, we bought like a 99-year-old house. Um, 
We did everything backwards, upside down, nothing immoral, nothing wrong, but totally outside the ideal and what was normal. And not only that, we now had a foster care system, a secular foster care system telling us what we were allowed to do and not do in our parenting. Mm -hmm. Now let's add that to it. And us figuring out how do we love and parent these kids well when they weren't ours for a period of time. We're told what we're allowed to do. We were told where they were allowed to go to school and where they weren't. We were told how we were allowed to discipline them and how we weren't. And we had to consistently say, well, then is what we're doing less than biblical? Is it less than ideal? And to some degree, yes. And to some degree, not at all. We just had to think outside the box. And so in a very real way, we were forced to practice this and say, what does it look like to live outside a formula altogether, but know that we're being consistent, we're being wise, we're loving them, we're loving the Lord, and we're being faithful to the job he's given us. So before we got married, we were engaged and we were attending church, and we came out of church one day. Now, again, Kimmy and Brittany were only three and four at the time, and I'm holding one, and Greg's holding one, and we're walking out of church, and a family's walking with us, and they said, are you guys from this area? They were introducing themselves. We were introducing ourselves. You guys from this area, where you live? And I said, well, I live in Flower Town. And Greg goes, yeah, I live in Mount Airy. Mm -hmm. You saw this confused look come out over their face, and we noticed, and we go, oh, we're not married. And then you saw their eyes go right to the girls, and we said, oh, and they're not our kids. <laughs> and then I don't know for what reason, I just felt so mortified and embarrassed, I just walked away. I was just like, I didn't, I didn't know how to explain this, I'm just going to keep walking. Um, and those moments happened over and over again where we were consistently trying to find ourselves explaining our lifestyle. So we were foster parents, so we did have some kids come and go. Used to feel like I always had to explain, like when people, they see four kids, and here it was like two, three, four, and five, mm -hmm. everywhere we went. Um, and people would go, wow, four kids in a row, you must have been busy. Or four kids in a row, wow, that was a lot of pregnancies. You look great for being pregnant. And I used to always feel this need to explain it and explain, I'm sorry, I wasn't pregnant. These aren't my kids. We are, they're adopted, they're foster And then after a while, I'm like, why am I doing this? Why am I explaining to perfect strangers <laughs> all this and in front of the kids? And I started just going with it. Oh, yeah, rough pregnancies. <laughs> oh, yeah, four long years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys were busy, right? Yeah, we were busy, whatever. <laughs> and I would just go with it because it was easier until one day. Um, I'm in a Trader Joe's, and we had a little baby, um, and the baby was... I don't know, probably four to eight days old. He was like a brand new baby. So here I am in Trader Joe's, and uh, I'm going through a uh, checkout, and the woman who's checking me out is pregnant. So she's so excited to see this little baby. So she's asking his name, and it's William. And she's asking me, like, how old he was, and I'm telling him. And she's saying, was the pregnancy hard? No, it wasn't hard, and I'm packing my bags. <laughs> and, and she said, um... She said, how many months was he? And I think I knew that. And so I'm just answering her questions. And it's getting further and further in until at some point she said, so where was he born? And for the life of me, I drew a blank. I couldn't even think of a hospital name in the moment. I just couldn't do it. And so I looked at her just stone blank, realizing I think I would have just lied because I was so far into all my lying <laughs> that I wouldn't have hesitated to do it, but I couldn't even think of a hospital. And so I just hung my head and said, I'm sorry, this isn't my baby. And I just kept packing the bag. <laughs> and I'm sure she probably would have called the cops if she thought she needed to. Some ladies here claiming this is a baby. And I got home and I told my husband, and he thought it was hysterical, just broke out laughing. Because I'm like, why couldn't I thought of a hospital? I couldn't make up a hospital if my life depended on it. So I get myself in these situations of how often do I explain our family situation? How often don't I explain our family situation? Now we've got kids where I don't feel like I need to tell them all where they're adopted. I don't have to explain that to people in public because now part of this is their story. Mm -hmm. This is their story to tell now too. So it's me saying I am the steward of their story. I'm the steward of our family story, my husband and I. But ultimately God's the author of all those stories. So what does it look like for me to steward their story well? Because what it means is I have to take all the events in their life and I have to remind them that not one of those moments was left outside of God's will and agenda. So I'm taking even the brokenness of their backgrounds and their histories and I'm reinterpreting it for them. Not to make it look good or sound good, but to bring God back into their story and remind them that he's the author of their story. Now we all have to do that. Our family story is unique and different, but that's what we have to do with all of our kids. In a very real way, adopting all of our kids 
even though we were moving in that direction, was painful. And there were nights I would lay up at night and say, Lord, please don't let these kids be taken from us. Please don't let, how many parents have to pray, please don't let the court take my child away from me. Um, in a very real way, I had to keep surrendering, saying, Lord, these are your kids. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't that what we all should be saying as parents? Mm-hmm. These are your kids. These are not mine. I'm a steward of these children. Mm-hmm. That is a very different mentality than an ownership principle, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I own them. You must do what I want them to do. Very early on, for good or ill, I had to say, these are not my kids, Lord. Help me to trust you and help me to steward them well. Now, it was how we told that story to them as well, how we shaped it. And it was hard. I mean, they all have different backgrounds. So you have two sibling groups. You have these girls who are biological, these boys who are biological. Clearly, Connor stands on his own. (laughs) Um, And then Justin came to us later. They came with family histories. They came with brokenness. Um, They came with things that we didn't even know until they got older. So one of our kids is a particularly challenging child. I mean, some days I think I'm wondering who's going to survive the day, me or them. then we, we have one of our sons, uh, we found out about five years ago that he was going to lose his vision. So that's Andrew right here that um, if you read my book, you'll hear about him a little bit. Justin was a, a foster child who came into our home. We became his legal guardian. So when he turned 18, he decided to walk out of our home and not to have anything to do with us again and just walked away from the Lord. So here's three years of investing in a, a child that we grew to love had a wonderful relationship with, and he walked away. Um, How do you love in brokenness? How do you love in imperfection? No family is perfect. And I share some of that because my fear is I don't want to look like the expert. That means your families don't struggle. Your families don't suffer. God gives us kids that are going to have brokenness, and we need to choose to love them well. Some of their brokenness comes because of their past. A lot of their brokenness comes because they're broken, sinful human beings. And guess what? You and I are too. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be brokenness in our home uh, that we've got to deal with. You can go to the next slide. So here's another way of, of talking about it. I love the picture of story. And you, you see this, the biblical narrative, that there is a greater redemptive story being told. And our stories lie within that redemptive story. So very early on, we started talking to our children about that, that your story isn't just your story, though it is. But it's part of a greater redemptive story. And it's also part of a greater family story. And our call was that we had to help our kids to see their story was never outside God's story. And here's one of the struggles with adoption particularly is um, families like to, we as Christians love to see adoption stories as this great magnificent uh, reflection of us being adopted in Christ. But we often miss is how the kids feel it out of brokenness. That to them, this is a broken story, not a great redemptive story. And we have a need to be faithful to helping re-engage them that from the time they were formed in their mother's room, God knew them. Not a piece of their story goes outside of God's will. That he's the author of their story. He's writing a good story. We don't always like the chapter we're in. We don't always like the characters who are in our story. Sometimes we don't like the main character. But God is a faithful and good author, and he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So I can talk to each of my kids, regardless of disability or failure or suffering or whatever it may be, I can say, God began this good work. He will be faithful to complete it. You're not the author of your story. I'm not the author of your story. God is the author of your story. And God's also the author of our family. So very early on, we talked to our kids about, you know, God knows who he's going to bring into our home. This is how we live our home out. Every home's different. I would never tell people to do life the way the Lowe family did life. We're a little bit crazy. Um, but I would say this is the story God gave us. And we love it. And I'm not going to be embarrassed by it. And I'm going to be faithful to it. And there's going to be difficulty in it. And who knows, you might see me on the 12 o'clock news one day because one of my kids are off doing something crazy. I don't put it past that God is capable of doing wonderful things in my kids' lives or they can go off the rails really quickly. Why? Because they're moral responders. They will choose who they serve. Mm -hmm. And all I can guarantee is, Lord, help me to be faithful in the midst of this story. I can't control what they'll be. And that's so terrifying and it's so liberating all at the same time. Because what it means is I can only be faithful, I can only be responsible for me. 
I am until they're 18 responsible for them, and I hope I'm responsible for them for the rest of my life to some degree, but they are going to choose who they serve. So Lord, help you and I to be faithful to stewarding their story well, to living inside a greater redemptive story, to pointing them to the author of their story. They are always meaning makers. Paul Tripp was great about saying this in some of his books, that children are worshipers, they're interpreters, and they're meaning makers. Well, we all are. So how are they going to do that without any loving guidance? That's our job, where we need to be faithful to that task. I'm going to stop for a minute. Any questions? Yeah, get back. In adoptive agencies, do they have concerns about whether the children that they uh, put out for adoption uh, go to church or are Christians, or whether the parents that they are placed with are Christians, or is that something that they don't concern themselves? Um, that's hard to answer. We actually went with a Christian agency, so that helps a lot. But that is, that's part of the problem that you have to learn to work within um, the context or the religious context that some families come from. Um, which again, it goes back to how, does it, how, do you, how are you faithful to what your kids are encountering? How are you faithful to, in our situation, what the birth fa parents were encountering and what they, their agenda was? But at the end of the day, all we really needed to do was figure out how's God calling us to love these kids, um, even within the parameters of a system that might tell us how to. Yeah. I guess one of the questions I have is I have a foster sister, and her family and her dad's in jail, and her mom has multiple children with many different guys. And so she, she still has visitation. So she can go home for weekends and sometimes weeks at a time. So how do we as Christians establish that same culture, but try and navigate it away from the secularism of maybe the, uh, the biological parents. So we can be Christian at home, and then when she interacts with her secular family, they still different values and different purposes. How do we reshape those and frame those to nurture and bring them back towards? Yeah, and I'll, tr I'll try to answer that in a way that actually I think is true of all kids. Yeah. Um, because I know not everybody has adoptive kids or foster kids. And really, it's funny because we don't think of our kids as adopted or foster, which is kind of dumb, right? But they are. But they're kids. There are our kids. They're our family. But we uniquely have to wrestle with things that some of you guys don't have to wrestle with, like birth family and past histories and stories. So in some ways, the way I approach my own kids with that issue is this is how God brought us together as a family. God brings families together in lots of different ways. This is how God brought our family together. Our posture, even in an adoption, is very different than a lot of adoptive families where the literature and a lot of the, the really neat kids' stories are, we went out searching for you, we, we spent years looking for you and planning this, and all that's really true. Our mentality was actually the exact opposite. God knows who he wants to bring into this home, and whether they come for a day or a week or a year or for good, Lord, help us to trust, entrust with the people you have in our home and that you bring to our home. We've said yes to kids. We've said no to kids. This is our family. This is the ethos. This is part of how we've established our family life to say one of our values is we want to open home as much as we can. We want to bring people in. Now that we have children, one of our values is also we protect the children in our home, which means now we're more careful with who we bring in our home. So that's true across the board for all of us, that we all need to care about the people shaping our children's lives. So I'm trying to get back to your question. You can ask me later if I don't answer it. Secularism, and when there's other family, families or family that is playing into that and informing the way our kids think, that is why you and I always have to be proactively engaged in relationship with our kids. And here's where I see a major uh, problem happening, that we are living separate lives from our kids. Um, our kids are growing up in a, in a school setting usually, and it used to be they would come home and they'd be stuck with us for the evening or on the weekends, minus sports and hobbies. Now they are connected. The moment they get home, they get on their phones, they get on FaceTime, they get on Facebook, they get on social media, they get on Xbox Live, they get on whatever they're getting on, and they're with their peers from the time they get home till the time they go to bed, way past the time you're going to bed and often into the middle of the night, and then they wake up again and they go back to their peers and they start that over again. It is peers raising peers. 
We are losing adult influence in children's lives altogether. So how can I speak against secularism entering in or a liberal view or a family <coughs> member when we're not acknowledging that there is way more of a peer influence than there ever was in our kids' lives and that the cultural norm is to put down adults and parental views. And you see this in media, in movies, in TV, in cartoons, where parents specifically, but adults at large, are foolish, unnecessary, incompetent, all over the place. And kids are buying into that, that they are their own source of wisdom. So I'm going to say this um, before, but this is why I go back to, I, I don't want to digress, but this is why I go back to, you and I have to be proactively pursuing our kids. We can't be passively waiting for them to want relationship with us because it won't happen. We've got to be proactively pursuing them and demonstrating we are for them. We are actively involved in their life. We have something to say about their life, which goes to what does nurturing family look like. We, we are pursuing them. We are going for them, even when they act like they don't want to be around you. My two boys are at the age where they think kissing their mom is not cool anymore. So I'll intentionally, when they're not looking, run up and grab them and kiss their face. And trust me, those greasy, pimply faces are not fun to kiss. <laughs> Everything in me wants to go, you're no fun to kiss either, by the way. But I'll do it because I want them to know this is normal and I love you. And no matter how frustrating or how uncool you think it is, you're not getting rid of me. That's the commitment kids lead to them. Or things like that. Not Arguing, you all have to go up around kissing teenagers. Um, <laughs> go ahead to the next one. So what did I say? That children are interpreting life and experiences, whether or not we talk to them about it. So often we avoid difficult conversa conversations like sex, adoption, abuse, um, any of these issues, death and dying, um, gender identity stuff. We, t we avoid talking about some of this hard stuff because we think, well, if they're not thinking about it, I don't want to put this thought in their head yet. We are then allowing the world to shape that for them. Because by the time, if they ever bring the topic up to you, by the time they do, they have already been given a worldview that they're buying into. They've already been giving opinions, and they've already <coughs> deemed you and I inadequate in speaking into those things. It is far better, you can go to the next one, it's far better for us to shape our child's views on the subject than to go back and debunk them. So Deuteronomy 6, I love, because here you have this principle in the passage that whether you're rising or sitting down or eating cereal or walking by the way or riding in your car, this, I am constantly engaging in my kids. And I want you to think for a minute, how often are the parents around kids doing that these days? And hopefully you and I are more the exception to the rule and we're doing it better than average. But I can't walk into a restaurant anymore where everybody's not plugged in to a cell phone. What a wacky thing to sit in a restaurant. And actually, we sit with our kids because we have a no cell phone policy ar around meals especially. Um, but we'll go to restaurants, and we're all sitting talking to each other. And, and all of us will look around the restaurant, and we will not find a table where somebody's not on a cell phone. And usually everybody at the table on a cell phone. We are not engaging. We're missing opportunity after opportunity to just talk. One of my best places to talk to my kids, actually the dining, the dining room table is the best. Meals are the best, and we're losing that too. With busyness of life, with work schedules, with kids' activities, we're even <coughs> losing meal times with our kids. Um, dinners out are overtaken by electronics. The next best place would be the car, but now we've got CD players, DVD players, online stuff in cars, so you can get in the car and buckle up and not have to say one word to anybody in the car, right? Um, so that's where I really torture my kids. I will have everything turned off. They're all strapped in. They have no place to go. <laughs> they are a captive audience, literally. Um, and so here's where it lies on you and I then as the adult to make up a conversation. And I mean make it up because sometimes I don't feel like talking either. I'm an introvert by nature. I don't know if you believe that, but I am. And so there are days I'm working all day long and I'm talking to people all day long. I just want to come home and not say a word. Well, good luck with that with six kids. What was I thinking? That's not possible, nor should it be part of my agenda. I'm, I'm sacrificing personal preferences to love well, which is another principle uh, um, that I talk about in the book that you and I need to do better, that personal preferences should be sacrificed when it means loving the other person well. Now, my husband and I have our preferences for how we want to do parenting, and those always play into how we raise our kids, how we do family life, how we even have rules. 
to have nothing to do with right or wrong, just preference. This is our preference. This is how we're going to do it. But the moment I see it harms somebody in my family, I've got to say, why am I doing this? I've always got to be willing to give up my preference to love well. So a great example of that is just um, me wanting to come home and be quiet at night and assuming that I should make my kids be quiet too or not bother me or not talk to me. I have one of our sons, Andrew. I use him as the, the, the example all the time because he isn't mine. But he has verbal diarrhea. If it is in his head, it is out his mouth at nauseam at all times. When he was little, he would walk around saying, I have to tell you something a hundred times a day. I'm like, just stop saying that and tell us what you have to tell us. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? A hundred times a day. So even here he is now a teenager, and we still will mimic him, the poor guy, because it was, can I ask you a question, or I have to tell you something so much. Uh, it was just incredible. Well, here he is 15, and he's still a talker. He's a debater, but comes, I mean, whatever's going on in his head, it comes out of his mouth, and he's talking about it, and it can be the utterly ridiculous. I don't know how many times I had conversations about why Batman wears black all the time, or why... I don't know, I mean, just crazy stuff where my brain wants to go, I do not have the brain power to have this conversation right now. This just seems so unimportant. But it's important to him. So there's two things going on here. One is, as a parent, I have got to say, you know, he needs to learn to be slow to speak and quicker to listen. I mean, helping Andrew means he needs to learn that not everybody enjoys these ridiculous conversations he enjoys having. So parenting him means, <clears throat> Andrew, is this building up or tearing down? Is this edifying or not edifying? Is this insane or not insane right now? Like, think about, do, do the people around you want to talk about this, or do you just want to talk about this? And how might that feel to the people around you if they don't want to talk about it? So loving him means I'm parenting him actively. But loving him also means I'm willing to have a ridiculous conversation because it makes him happy. And because I'm saying you're worth listening to. And because I'm saying my desire to be quiet right now isn't as important as building connection with you. So even yesterday, was it yesterday? Yeah. So the Xbox is the most hated possession in my house right now by me. Not by anybody else, but by me. Why? Because it's like it produces sin in my children. And I know that's not true. I know they already have sin in them. But the <laughs> Xbox seems to present more sin. I think it fosters it. I think it digs into their hearts and finds it there and just goes, woo, and throws it around. <laughs> and sibling rivalry runs amok in our home when the Xbox is on. It's insanity. So we're having this conversation, and we're sitting at the table trying to figure out why three of the teenagers are arguing over this Xbox. And at some point, I was tempted to roll my eyes because I'm like, this is just ridiculous. About 40 minutes later, we're still having this conversation and talking through, so what does love look like here? So would love mean that you give that person a turn? Or does love mean you say, no, it's not your turn, it's my turn? At nauseam having this conversation, even to me, it felt like it went on a little too long until finally I'm like, OK, I think we wore the subject out. You guys can all leave. And one of my kids stands up and goes, good talk, mom, thanks. I'm like, good talk, are you insane? <laughs> what planet did you come from? He goes, Oh, I enjoyed it. You didn't yell at us. You were just talking with us, and you were right. We weren't loving each other well. Wow, that was profound. Can I record you and remind you of this for the next 30 years? Um, those are the conversations that we'll never have if we're just too busy to have them. And this goes back to pace of life, our value system, that we want compliance over dialogue. In that moment, I'd much rather have dialogue than an hour conversation over the Xbox. But I won their heart, at least for that moment. Who knows what will happen tomorrow when the Xbox goes on again. But I won their heart by being willing to talk to them. And is it exhausting? It is. Does it take time? It does. Do we always have time? No. But if you and I don't commit to having those kind of conversations, and again, put aside parenting now. Is that true in marriage? Is that true in relationships in the church? Do we ever sit down and how often the, does our how are you really mean, just say fine so we can talk about something else or move on to the next person. When does it really mean, I, no, really, I want to know how you are, what's going on in your life. We're willing to have those kind of conversations. So anyway, Deuteronomy 6. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, do you have like a good measure of like um, how often you're sacrificially loving someone or if you need to do something for yourself to like teach that person something? Like, I think it's called the Holy Spirit. 
<laughs> I don't, and that's why what I'm arguing is much harder than a formula. Because I mean, that's exactly what we want. I want to know, well, when am I doing it well? And you know what? As much as I might do it well, I fail at it too. So I can give you great examples of, look how well Julie just loved her kids. And the next day, I fail royally at it. Um, because we all struggle with this. And I think it's not not struggling. It's saying this will consistently be my desire for my family. Um, but that said, what are the principles? So the principles to me just really would be, Lord, am I loving, who am I loving right now by not having this conversation? Or who am I loving right now by having this conversation? Am I loving me just because I'm going to make my point and make my kids listen to me right now? Or am I loving them because I'm willing to patiently talk this out even if it feels like it's like it's ridiculous um, so one of my questions at least in my own heart is who am I loving right now and Lord is this how you would be with them right now so, yeah. I'm just curious through your counseling experience uh, as time passes um, how much of a role do you see tech playing in, 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 in the nature of relationships that are not working well do you have you seen that where like you've uh, recommended to couples um, saying, look, can you just disconnect from your phone or, or from your laptop or whatever and give that a try and <coughs> see if, because I find in my own just friendship relationships, it's like liking somebody's cat video over and over again doesn't really connect me with that person. Yeah. I'm not really it's pseudo connection. Yeah. yeah. It's a false sense of connection. Well, let me answer that in several ways. And I hate sounding like I'm anti technology because I'm not, but I, I'll preface that by saying I'll sound like I'm anti technology, but it just is changing us all. It just is. The research is showing that. Forget what we think morally as believers. Research is demonstrating kids are growing up not <coughs> learning how to talk, not knowing how to interact. They're less mature as a result of it. They have neck issues and back issues and sleeping issues, like the whole gamut, physically to non-physically to socially to relationally to even the brain changing because they're the way they're being entertained to death. All that is out there. And thankfully not by me, so I, I, I can't say I'm biased. Now that said, I have a son who's going blind. His lifeline is his iPad. He lives in a normal school, in a normal world, because he can do things online. I am so thankful technology is doing that. Our lack of monitoring our kids' technology is our undoing for our kids. Our buying into kids should have iPhones and iPads and they're not filtered and they're not checked and there are no parental controls and we don't have an open book, open phone policy is our fault because we're teaching kids an entitlement that it is a right to own a cell phone and it is a right that I'm on social media and that I should be doing all these things to be normal. And to be honest, I think as parents, we buy into that over and over. And it's hard. I'm saying that to you and it's hard for me because most of my kids do not have cell phones and the more I deal with families, the more convinced I am they shouldn't have them until they're 18 and they can pay for them themselves. Um, and even then I need to teach stewardship principles and that is so off the wall odd to everybody I talk to that people I fear won't even listen to me because it's so weird that I would say that for teenagers or that I would say no social media. But going back to your question, what a lot of the research is saying is people that are on social media, especially teenage girls, are more depressed, more suicidal, and more anxious than they ever have been in their life. As a counselor who is counseling people, people who are on social media, not just kids, are more depressed, more anxious, and more unhappy with their lives than they ever have been. Will I claim to know why other than it's a constant comparison? That would be one of my guesses. But I think the other is it's pseudo-relationship. You're not really connected, but you're always connected. But it's not meaningful deep connection. Yeah, Julie, you're talking a lot about how to shape this narrative internally. How do you shape that externally for your extended family? And I'm thinking of particular maybe people who have non-related family members, extended family. You're shaping the narrative here for them. But they're going to have a lot of questions about how you do that and how that might introduce conflict for your family from an example. expectations that parents have about uh, the type of connectivity they're going to have with their grandkid. And you say, no social media, no iPad, no FaceTime. And what uh, do they do? Or the gift they want to give their kid at Christmas. I want to give my kid an Xbox, no Xbox in our home, no iPad in our home. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, you don't let me, you, you let the other grandparent give this, but you don't let me give this. Uh, and how do you shape that narrative for them so that they understand the value? And, and I'm thinking specifically maybe for those who either have non-Christian family members who are thinking in this competition way, yeah. or for those who have undiscipled parents who love the Lord, but this framework 
theirs. Yeah, it's just not theirs. Yeah. Um, well, you have to let them get mad at you first, and then you have to talk it through with them, I think. Um, so let me talk this out, and feel free to push back on this. But um, I've come across that but sometimes less to do with electronics and more to do with my parenting approach with a child where um, we have one particularly difficult child and to really rein in, there, there is a, I would say, an obsession with peer influence. And so we have intentionally made her world smaller um, because we are trying to instill maturity and discipleship. And we will constantly get pushback from that um, almost like a perception you're part of the problem, which is, I think, what happens with technology, too. Well, you know, your kids are growing up in a technology world, and you're just depriving them. You're just teaching them to behind the game. And schools are doing everything on iPads and computers now, and so that's even another reason to say, well, why aren't you letting them, and why aren't you teaching them? And so what you're dealing with is they're questioning your priorities and values as a parent, whether it's the way you're parenting a child or disciplining a child or not disciplining a child, or what you're allowing in your home and what technology you're allowing. So on one hand, the most uncomfortable thing is saying, it is OK if they don't agree with me and don't like me. I've got to accept that for one, that that could be, that could be just what's going to happen. The second would be then that if I can be more intentional and thoughtful for my explanation, they may not agree with me, but they at least understand there's a thoughtful reason behind it. So I start with, I'm really sorry, this is the rule. Um, this is what we want for our kids. And then, especially if it's a competition between grandparents, and I'd say, here are some things the kids would absolutely love, though. Here are ways that they would love this. And I'm actually at the place more where I argue, give the gift of time. Like, take them on events. Do things with them. Take them on a trip. You want to spend $900 on a cell phone, go take them to Disney World or something. I mean. Not that that would work either. But you're wanting to think through of here's what we really value. We value relationship. And our kids want you, not things. Actually, my kids kind of do want the things too, but they'll be fine without them. <laughs> yeah. um, so what do you do if they don't really want to talk? Like I remember when I was a kid, like my parents would try to talk to me sometimes, and I would just kind of shut it down. Um, and I know a lot of people, even like people among my own age group, that like you try to talk and it's like, you ask like, how are you? And it's like, it's good. And they won't go any further. They won't let you go any Yeah, my kids come home from school. So how was your day, guys? Fine. Boring. It's either boring or fine. It's usually the, the answers. Um, you just don't let it go. That's where um, the gift is to listen. The skill is to hear. So, and the other skill is to keep pursuing. And so when I say keep pursuing, um, it doesn't mean be an absolute obnoxious parent to your kids, but it does mean push them past their comfort zone. And I'm always gauging, is, am I really actually frustrating my child right now by asking them more questions? Or am I actually just pushing them to the other side where now they'll start opening up? Um, so for example, coming home from school, how was your day? Well, I'm expecting to get that answer. So I need to be more creative in what question I even ask when they walk in the door, right? Tell me three things that happened today. Or tell me what was algebra like. Or any kids get in trouble today? Because kids, and by the way, this is a brilliant way of getting your kids to talk. They won't talk about themselves, but they'll tell you everything their peer group is doing and everything their friends are doing. So if you want to know what's going on in your child's life, say, so tell me what kids are doing in seventh grade now to get in trouble. What are the bad things kids are doing? What are the boys talking about in seventh grade? Of course, not that you would talk about those things, but what are they talking about? And they will tell everything their, their peer group is doing. And that's giving you reflection into their world. So I'm getting them to talk at any point. And what I find is when they talk about the safe stuff, you slowly move in to the more personal stuff. And they'll open up. But you and I have to be safe people. So hopefully I'm not doing that just to manipulate and say, aha, I caught you. I do that because I want to build a relationship, and I really genuinely want to know. And what my kids will often hear me say is, wow, if that's happening in 10th grade, that must be hard for you because you're in 10th grade. How does that affect you? Yeah, it's hard sometimes, or sometimes I feel different, or sometimes I'm tempted to vape, or sometimes I'm tempted to want to talk about what they're talking about, but you don't let us on the Xbox, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> and get those little jabs in there, too. You're right. You're right. I don't let you know that. All my friends think you are the weirdest parents because you don't have electronics on school nights. They think that's crazy. 
I'm so sorry, guys. That must be really hard. What, what do you say to your friends? We say, you're crazy, too. <laughs> okay. Thanks for throwing me under the bus. I'll say, well, really, guys, why do you think we do it? Do you think we're doing it to be mean? And almost at nauseam now, they'll say, no, we know you're not being mean. We know it's not good for us to be on the Xbox all night long. We know it's not good for us to be on electronics. So it's really interesting that though they will throw us under the bus with their peer group, they actually know that we really love them even when they disagree with our rules. And we do try to be really reasonable. So we'll talk it out with them and we'll say, do you guys, you think we should have, you think we should allow electronics on a school night? And the kids are like, well, maybe an hour, or well, maybe, maybe 30 minutes, or no, you're right, by the time I'm done homework, I, I don't have any time left. Right, exactly. One of, and so let me give you this rule. This is, there's a principle behind rules. And this is what I'm saying where your family rules need to be far different than my family rules. Why? Because you've got different people in your home. But the same principles will be under those rules. So our kids do go to school. They're not homeschooled. They, I don't have them all day. I work. So what we say to our kids is, guys, we have you probably less than three hours a night. I don't want to spend that three hours in front of a screen. I love you. I want to talk to you. I want to engage with you. So we're saying no screens. We're saying no, um, none of that stuff on school nights. As a general rule, and we can break the rule whenever we want. We can have a movie night. We can chill out. We can listen to YouTube, something goofy on YouTube, the dancing cats, whatever it is. We can do that stuff, but it's the exception rather than the rule because we know, and what we've said is, guys, we love you. We don't get to see you all day. Why do we want to stick you in front of screens the rest of the night? Why do we want to be in front of screens the rest of the night? We want to engage with you. So here's the principle of nurturing family and nurturing relationship, right? The principle is, I want relationship with you. It's not that the rule should be, every family in the United States of America should have the same rule the low family has. Because there's reasons it's not going to be the same. But the principles behind don't change. And it's how you adapt them to what's going to help your family thrive and what's going to build engagement. So now you take a family that does homeschool, and they spend all day together. They're going on field trips or doing things. Maybe at night is a perfect time to jump on the screens and have downtime. It's going to be different for every family. Okay. I was going to say, one thing that does help, at least it helps me, is that I would share things that I'm doing that they can like, engage with. So if I'm preparing to learn these Bible study talks, I'll tell my boys, hey, guys, please pray for mom. I'm working hard on this Bible study. And can you pray right now for me? And they pray. And they'll often follow up, mom, how did your Bible study talk go? And so I think some of it is also them learning how to listen to things. Or, hey, there's this woman in the church who has cancer right now. You know, I'm going to bring her a meal. Boys, you want to come? Or do you want to write her a note together? Like, I think that's the kind of stuff that kind of models for them. It's not that we don't ask them questions about their world and enter into their world. Of course we do that, and we try our best to, right? But I think also modeling, what does it mean to live the Christian life? What does it mean that mom and dad are doing stuff too? And how can they enter in? How can they pray for you? How can they join you in kind of the things that you're doing for the church? Or kind of like to get them outside of their little world too, I guess. Yeah, let me throw out a couple other ideas too, getting back to that question. So when my kids feel don't feel like talking or they're shutting down, I do want to gauge when do they just need a half an hour to chill out and when will I approach them later on. So I think there's wisdom issues there. Then there's also a, all right, I've got to be much more brilliant at coming up with thoughtful questions. So going back to what you're asking, like um, what you do in school? I mean, here's the easy ones that probably teenagers don't want to talk about or um, just random things. So actually, I'll give you another example. At our dining room table, we have this box. It's a clear box, and it's called Table Topics. Um, and actually, there's tons of things out there like them. We've used them all. We have these little chat packs that you can put in your car. I use stuff like this in counseling. But the Table Topics, you can Google them on Amazon, are just questions that you're just pulling out and asking. And at a very early age, we start doing this with our kids. Um, actually without the table topics, but just how do we foster conversation? And it means I've got to be willing to talk about the ridiculous stuff that they are willing to talk about. And then I work my way into the harder stuff. Um, and like Miriam said, we share our, our stuff. We're honest about our struggles with sin. If we're going to be confronting them with their stuff, we've got to say there's no white sheep in this family. We're all black sheep. Um, all ground is even at the foot of the cross. We all need Jesus. Dad and I need Jesus too. Here's a place I've really struggled today. Well, we, mim we, mi we mimic, and we have our kids mimic back. So, hey, Mom, how was your day? So maybe they're coming in boring. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mom, good to see you. How was your day? 
And then they all stop and look at me. I'm like, my day was great. Thank you so much for asking about my day. I'm like, great, Mom. That's really funny. Well, here's why my day was hard for me today. So I just start talking about my day and acting like they're asking me those questions. So eventually they're laughing or they're like, all right, fine. What's for snack now? Um, I'm trying to look for ways to use humor, to engage them, to just say what, you, what you're saying matters to me. Um, the other thing that kids will often say is, I don't know, right? And we let them get away with it. So that's why they do it. So how do you creatively not let kids get away with the I don't know question? And um, I wrote about this in a blog for CCEF because I was at a conference one time and somebody said, here's what you do when kids say I don't know. You say to them, well, if you did know, what would your answer be? <laughs> and 50% of the time, you'll get the answer. <laughs> I sat there, I go, that's brilliant. I started thinking about it, I'm like, well, wait a minute, I actually do that all the time, I just don't use those words. I'll often say things like, well, think about it, I have time. Or in counseling especially, I'll say, you know what, I'm not in a hurry. What you have to say means a lot to me. I care about what you think. I'm sure you've never had to stop and think about it. So just take a minute and think about it. What are they feeling now? Pressure. I have to say something because Julie's obviously not talking, so somebody's got to be talking right now. And sometimes they'll say, I don't know again. And I go, no, I really, I really care about what you have to say, so think about it. And I use silence in a good way to pressure them to talk. Now, again, this could backfire on you, and you don't want to anger people. But genuinely, when you do care and you genuinely want to know, they'll start talking. And it can be uncomfortable for 15, 20 minutes, but it can end up being a really good conversation. The problem is they've learned it works that I don't have to look at my own heart, I don't have to think about my own motives and my reasons for my behavior, or I don't have to think, period. If I just say I don't know, the teacher will pass over me, the counselor will start talking, and mom and dad will go into lecture mode, and I'm off the hook. And we want to show the opposite. Were you going to say something? I just wondered if you had any statistics about, um, as Christian parents, like we always made our kids go to church. It was non-negotiable. You go. And I just wonder if over time, does that backfire or do those kids, do those kids become solid Christians? That's a great question. I actually don't know the statistics. I, um, I have opinions, but I don't know the statistics. Um, I, think, I, think, I think I'm trying really hard not to get off on another tangent is what I'm thinking. I think we are raising a generation that thinks they have more say in those decisions than they should. I also think it's not helpful for us just to be dictatorial in the way we do parenting. I think there's nothing wrong with that rule. And as a matter of fact, I'd probably argue that's exactly how we all should be doing it. But again, it goes back to what's the heart uh, I present and what's the way and the heart in which I present it to my kids. I love you guys. This has got to be important. We want it to be important to you. I can't make you love the Lord. But I can make you go to church and hear about them. Um, my hope, though, is that you'll want to grow to love the Lord yourself. And that's far better and that's far more important. So I'm appealing to their character and their heart in that. Um, and I think more statistics, to be honest, would support that if you give kids the choice, they'll stop going. And then they'll not go back. Um, why do kids grow up and then stop attending church? That's a whole other cultural problem. And there are good books out there on that. Um, the tangent I can go off on is we're also buying into a cultural value that you're 18, you make all your own choices. Instead of going, you're 18, now the responsibility lies on you to make wise choices. And your family should be an important priority to you. And considering family and considering adults' uh, influence should be wise. Not a, you're 18, so now it's all on you, buddy. Um, and that's, I see that consistently being uh, ingrained in young people in ways that's really unhealthy. Mm -hmm. um, so let me go back to the table topics for a minute, because I do think it goes back to, so nurturing family, building conversations, engaging them. Let's talk about these table topics where it will just bring out conversations. They ask questions, you don't have to think of them. So when you and I feel like, I don't know, I don't have anything to say, what am I going to talk about? There's apps you can get on your phone now. You can just pull out the app at, and we'll do this sometimes at a restaurant, pull out an app and say, all right, guys, weigh in. And we'll read the question, and they all go around the table and weigh in. What's really, really good about that is several things. I'm teaching them the art of conversation. 
I'm showing you all can have your own opinions and I'm going to respect it. I'm not going to agree with them all, but I will respect the fact that you can have your own opinions on this subject. Um, and they're benefiting by hearing each other's opinions and seeing that we treat them as equals in the conversation. Um, and they're just really good at it. Our kids are teenagers now. They will sit down and talk to us. They will sit around the table. They would quickly, without a heartbeat, I know, go off with their friends. Don't get me wrong. But I also know they don't mind sitting down with us. We'll have adult friends over, which is here another great principle. You need to put your kids around other godly adults mm -hmm. and influencers, the influence of wise people in their life. I will even say to my teenagers, I want you to have two adult cell phones in your phone. And that we'll talk about who those can be. Because if for some reason you're in trouble and you either can't reach me or you're afraid to reach me, you need to know these two adults you can call and they're there for you. So I'm shaping that they don't have all kinds of friends and peer group that they go to when they're in trouble, but say these are the wise people. So if you're afraid to talk to us, know these people. And I went to those adults and said, can I have my kids have your cell phone number? Can they be a possibility of connecting with you? Haven't had to use that yet, but what I'm doing is I'm setting them up to succeed and thrive, or I'm setting them up to say, you might have a problem. You need to know what your options are if you have a problem. So you're just fostering that, encouraging that. But we'll have adults come over, and our kids will all swarm around them. Sometimes it's frustrating, because I want to say, shoot, go away, let me talk. <laughs> but they're all there wanting to talk with them. And there was one day in particular, I remember we had an, uh, a couple come over, and all four of our teenagers were sitting there talking with them. And I stopped for a minute and thought about it. I'm like, this is a really cool thing that my kids want to talk to these adults. Not only do they want to, they don't mind it, they're having fun. This is what I want for my kids. Why would I want to se segregate them and separate them off and say, go do your thing so the adults can have their fun? Not that there's anything wrong with that, but there is a way in which we segregate generations rather than bringing them together and there being this one another we're growing from. All right, how are we doing on time? It's 6.30, but we started a few minutes late, so if you want to take maybe five minutes to kind of bring yourself to where you'd like to be. Okay, so... Um, I do give you guys a really long PowerPoint, and if you want anybody to have access to it, you're welcome to give it to them. The rest of what I say is a lot of this peer influence and regaining adult influence in our kids' lives and shaping them, especially when they're younger, helping them to grow up to see that as a wonderful thing, that they have positive memories. So I loved home groups. Um, when our kids were really little, we had a small group, a home group in our home, and we struggle you all know this when you have child care issues we had two families so our family had five kids another family had five kids so between two families where we had 10 kids that were totally outnumbering us all and overwhelming and figuring out babysitting and child care and who's going to watch the kids so we can actually pray and have a bible study it's a logistical nightmare and everything we tried worked for maybe two months and then it didn't work all of a sudden um and we ended up realizing, and I just think there's lots of ways to do this, but at the end of the day, just re relationship and just our kids being in relationship with other families and godly families and watching it and even letting them be a part of prayer, which can sometimes mean that you get very little praying done and sometimes mean that you're doing a lot of praying. But kids are growing up in a culture then where they're seeing this is what people do. This is my normal. Not going to school and watching kids on social media um, have fights and battles and bullying and catty stuff going on, they're going to be exposed to that. So how much more do you and I need to be proactively fighting the other side of that battle and trying to infuse godly, good relationships in their life? Um, our kids will now, as teenagers, just find us and sit down. My husband and I will sometimes say, we just want to go sit out on the porch and have some time together. And the kids will slowly start trickling out with us. And one night, I'm like, Greg, let's get up and go inside. And as they're all talking, we got up and walked inside and sat down on the couch and continued our conversation. They slowly started tricking me back. <laughs> it's like they were following us wherever we went. Now, I laugh at those things because it frustrated me, and I should be so thankful for that. I should be so thankful my teenagers want to follow me around and talk to me. What crazy kind of person am I to argue that? It's all our perspective, right? It's all what we choose to value and engage in. So understanding the influences of culture and understanding how you and I tend to buy into them and how we need to fight against them and how some of them can be healthy. I want my kids to have healthy friends. I want them to have fun. I want them to go out to Dorney Park and do cool things with their peer group. I'm not opposed to that at all. 
I'm just opposed to the level in which it pervades our children's lives and the way it then informs their worldview um, and how they think about life and reality. So let me just open it for a few questions before we close. Yeah. Um, so I know you've been talking mostly about how to like foster a relationship with your children and I'm wondering, um, so my husband and I don't have kids yet, but we have kind of like the opposite challenge with a kind of brokenness in our parents. Um, his family, they, he lost his mom when he was younger and his dad got remarried and it's a very frustrating, difficult situation and we're constantly trying to figure out as the kids in the family how to foster a better relationship with our parents. And it's kind of, it's really difficult because they're not quite believers, but we love them and we want to love them well. So I'm wondering if you have any advice on how, as a grown-up child, <laughs> how yeah. to move toward your parents and foster the relationship you're explaining. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, um, I think the principles, again, I think the principles are actually the same, but the application is different because now it's not, it's not me as an adult moving towards a younger, it's me as an adult moving towards a parent or maybe it's like this. I, I have this way of thinking like when we're parenting our kids, the authority um, and decision making is kind of like this and as they get older it starts to shift a little. So eventually our kids, they'll be independent of us and we'll be in some ways equal, but I hope my influence, the way they think of me and my influence on them is still kind of as a mentor, wisdom, voice of wisdom. But it's, it's like this a lot more. And then you hit these years, especially when they turn 18 and go to college, right, where they're fighting independence. And so they're fighting you, seeing you as a, as a problem when they're trying to become independent. But here's the thing. It slowly starts shifting to this. Eventually, my children will be my caretaker. I'm going to be at their mercy, which quite honestly is a scary thought sometimes. <laughs> My husband loves to joke and say, you know all those diapers I had to change on you? Well, that's going to turn around now soon. Um, but there is this sense where it goes like this, right? So you're talking, right? You're the child where you're independent now. What does it look like? I don't know if you guys would be like this or this or this. But how does it, how do we wisely move towards relationships that feel different in family life? And that's where I think whether it's grandparents or aunts or uncles or um, church family, there's expectations are different, um, level of relationships different, but I think the principles are the same where I say I love you and I'm going to do my best to enter into your life and have conversations with you, even if they're conversations I don't really like. Um, or they're conversations I don't find helpful in hopes that Lord you give me an opportunity to influence them. And maybe my influence in my parents' life is they're seeing their kids love them. Mm -hmm and we're a Christian and we love them. We don't judge them or we're not preaching at them, but it might win them over in ways you never imagined just because you are actively pursuing them. So that's where I think, wow, godly biblical principles are timeless and they apply in all relationship, but we've got to contextualize it to think differently. Do you have to step back at some point if it just doesn't work? Like, I, I know we're all supposed to love constantly and always keep pursuing, but I mean, I guess it's hard to find the balance of um, where to draw the line with like how much we should be focusing on our own marriage and our own kids one day and also fostering the relationship with parents that we've grown up from and left. Yeah, that's very fair. And I think there's the wisdom issue, right? Where for one, one couple, maybe the Lord's calling me to move towards my parents more. And for you, the Lord's calling you to move away because of something unhealthy or unwise. I mean, those are just the nuances of relationships where I want to pursue people that are difficult to love. But then there's also relationships where it's damaging and unhelpful and they'll suck all the time from you to the degree now I'm not loving my spouse or my kids well. And you're making a very different decision. Um, so what are the principles of what's wise and loving and godly and consistent? And when does it become unhelpful to be engaging a person versus helpful to engaging a person? They're all great questions to ask. I want to thank Julie for her time here. And if you all would just help me thank her real quick.